Hello, friends, and thanks for hanging out with us here on The Market Report today on Cointelegraph. We hope those here in the States had a great holiday and those around the globe, welcome to The Market Report this week. I am your host, Benton, and we are joined by our resident experts, Jordan Feneseth, Yashu Gola, and Sam Borgi. Jordan uses his background in psychology and human behavior to spot all of the emerging trends in the crypto markets. Sam Borgi is our business editor at Cointelegraph, where he brings a decade of experience in economic analysis and financial market writing. And Yashu Gola is a financial analyst and markets writer at CT who has been covering crypto industry since 2014. Folks, we're here. We're back at it again. Happy Tuesday. Uh, what is going on this week? How are we feeling? Has sentiment changed at all since last week? Jordan, how are we feeling this week, man? I'm doing good. Had a nice little vacation yesterday. Just kind of hanging in there. It seems like it's about more of the same going on with Bitcoin and crypto. I get like, People don't realize it's going to be a long, long, hard slug through a market or a crypto market or crypto winter, but we'll get there eventually. Don't lose faith. Very good. And Sam, how are we feeling this week? Well, all I'm really seeing is lower highs and fake rallies and not a lot of sentiment, not a lot of volume. Really nothing has happened. So it's pretty much status quo for me. All right. And we welcome Yashu back on the show. Uh, Yashu is going to have his own segment today that we're very excited to dive into with some of his technical analysis. Yashu, what's going on this week, man? Well, my 1 billion relatives are calling me again and again to know if it's a rally and are we in for a long term rebound. So even a small spike really uh, you know, make them excited, which I hate. So I actually kind of agree with Sam. I'm concerned about them. Exactly. It's been a long sludge, as everyone has kind of alluded to here over the last couple of months. Are we through the thick of it yet? No one knows. What we're going to dive in today is a comprehensive overview of where we are at. We're going to bring you some of the biggest articles this week uh, and what could potentially forecast the months ahead. So make Make sure you are tuning in. If you haven't liked and subscribed, go ahead and do so now. We are Cointelegraph on YouTube, and we're here Tuesdays, 12 p.m. So go ahead and hit that notification bell so that you know when we come on with the live special episodes. Those could be coming up depending on what's happening in the markets. We want to make sure that you get your news first. And today, we're going to be giving away a $50 voucher to the Cointelegraph store. I want to take a quick quick second to pivot to the chat and thank everyone for tuning in all the friends of the show i see vikram i see Catherine, i see luciana glad to have everyone here uh on today's show i know we have an action-packed lineup for you but first things first we're gonna go ahead and get into our weekly roundup video for this week so you know that everything that's been happening in the twitter sphere so danilo let's go ahead and jump into our roundup for this week
And we have been monitoring that Celsius situation, which I find uh, was interesting to see that uh, their liquidation point has gotten lower and lower. So hopefully there's no more contagion, uh, but we will see. It seems like things keep popping up week to week. Another interesting headline that I thought I saw in there was the FTX buying BlockFi. Uh, real quick, curious to hear your guys' thoughts. Is FTX going to run the entire crypto world? Is it just going to buy out everyone and consolidate everything? Sam, I'll well, get this to you first. We've seen that in other industries yeah. in the past and stuff. And I think I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago. Like I thought somebody would step in to try and help stem the contagion, which looks like SBF is doing. They, they think they're, they're just one of the biggest players in the field. They, they seem to be better off than even like a Coinbase or something as far as like the, the back, what their back office looks like. So I don't know. I think that they're just trying to help out the whole industry, but I think there'll be plenty of um, opportunities for other companies to come in later. Yeah, well, there was quite a bit of conflicting reports on what we were going to see with that acquisition. It was initially reported at 25 million, but apparently they struck a deal later that gives FTX the opportunity or the ability to buy Block Five for up to 240 million. So, um, you know, this level of consolidation is—I don't think it's—it's it's a great thing for the industry. But uh, what this deleveraging effect has done is it's really weeded out all of the troubled players, and there aren't very many companies in good standing that are left. So um, you could probably expect it to continue as the contagion effects from what we've seen over the past, the market implosion that we've seen over the past six months begins to settle. Very interesting. Yashu, well, any thoughts about this whole FTX thing? Yes, so I, I do think that BlockFi is a great idea that is completely implemented wrong because I think they, they, they never had the safety net to really uh, face a crash like this. And uh, I think if FTX is investing in an idea and they can actually put money and make it better. So yes, between the conflicting reports, as Sam mentioned, uh, yeah, uh, that, this would be a very great, you know, big of a deal because FTX uh, is known to do things, you know, quite in a traditional manner. They have that approach. They, are, they, they take less risks and they work on a slow and uh, organic building. So yes, I'm like it's a, it's a very positive move for the entire crypto industry if FTX jumps into buy BlockFi. Does this set the precedent though that FTX is just going to be the savior uh, when we hit these downturns? You know, in in future times, I guess uh, is that the precedent that we're kind of setting here is that they then can bail out everyone in the future? You know, I, I do kind of question that. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, well. Uh, the reality is we don't have a buyer of last resort in crypto. You know, no one is going to be buying, you know, going to be uh, backstopping the massive losses that we saw. Um, so you're going to start to see some of these, these massive blue chip companies in crypto step in, but uh, they can only absorb so much, right? I know that, you know, Sam Bankman Fried now has been connected with some, some miners as well. There's a lot of speculation about their expansion, but um you know, when, when, when crypto companies go bust, there's no one else, there's no one there left to help them. No government is going to step in to help them or bail them out. So uh, remaining assets will be scooped up by, by existing crypto players and maybe even some players outside of crypto. You take a look at Celsius, there's been rumors that Goldman Sachs wants to buy their assets. So we'll see how that goes. Interesting times ahead. Uh for this week for our market news. Uh, this one is crypto community eyeing three macro events to tip crypto scales in July. Typically we've seen historically speaking, when we get into these summer months here in the Northern hemisphere, crypto markets heat up. We're not in the territory right now though with the bear market. Uh, so what are the big three things that we're looking for? Danilo, if you wanna go ahead and just pull up this quick article written by uh, Felix NG. And I want to go ahead and touch on some of these highlights and then get our experts insights, uh, because one of the big things that I pulled out of this was uh, when, when we're in this crypto market crash, an overall positive sign for the industry is going to rely on some of these three big key announcements that are about to come up. So the CPI, which we've talked about on previous episodes, uh, the next report comes out on the 13th. And one of the things that I wanted to notate is last time we saw this report come out, it was 8.6 CPI. So I want to kick this over to Sam. Why is this such an important marker uh, for the macro environment currently? And what are you really looking for out of this next report on July 13th? 
Sure. So it's an important metric for the macro climate because the Federal Reserve is tracking inflation and its monetary policies based in large part on inflation. As everyone watching is, is well aware, inflation is spiraling out of control. So the idea is that if the CPI print continues higher, then the Federal Reserve is going to take a more aggressive approach to trying to rein in inflation, right? Because the Fed's call on inflation or their missed call was probably the worst forecast I've ever seen. Imagine calling inflation to be transitory and then inflation goes out of control less than a year later, despite the fact that we all have access to the same data. So for those of you looking for a bullish take, what you want to see is you want to see the CPI begin to moderate, okay? which means that the year over year growth is going to slow. That's what a lot of the hopeful people are looking at. I think we could probably see a CPI peak in June, um, you know, especially as commodity prices begin to come down a little bit. But that just means that inflation is going to go, it's going to continue going higher, but the year over year increase is going to be, is going to be smaller. So um, that's why everyone is looking at inflation because it informs what the Federal Reserve is going to do. The interesting thing is that the Fed actually doesn't use CPI as its benchmark. It uses the core PCE index, which is actually understates inflation a lot more. All that said, the inflation numbers give us an indication of just how bad prices are going out of control and how much leverage the Fed is going to have to continue hiking rates, despite the fact that we're likely heading into a recession. So I guess what would be a number that that we're looking for, you know, heading into this? Is there any kind of, uh, you know, could we touch as high as nine? Or are we looking for stabilization around this like 8.6? So I haven't seen any uh, forecasts yet. Usually the forecast will start coming out probably in the next couple of days. Um, my expectation as of last month was that June may be the peak. We could see a, a print higher than 8.6 annually, year over year, I should say, for June before we begin to moderate in the second half of the year. So I think that that's, that's kind of my base case. But uh, right now it's, it's all about expectations and how to manage those expectations Everyone's expecting the, the, the CPI to begin to moderate at some point. We just don't know when the peak is going to happen. It may have happened in May, but we could have another month of really hot CPI, especially as the home home homeowner equivalent rent portion begins to be be, be you know be, be more priced in. So we'll, we'll find out very soon. Very good. And I think Jordan, the, I, I want to read. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say on the retail side, like that's the official like how the official side is, is responding to it but i don't even think the retail side is necessarily looking at the cpi so much as like just looking at their grocery bill and they're not going to want to buy any kind of crypto until they know that they can feed their family for the rest of the year or anything like that like this is like if we're waiting for a retail kind of drives a lot of the momentum in the, the market and institutions can maybe come in and big bring big lifts but retail ain't going to get any kind of excited about cryptocurrencies until inflation goes down which might be a year or so so yeah, it's going to be a rough go. Well, and Yashu, how do you typically options. like to to view the CPI when you're kind of like assessing uh, the market situations? Is that a big indicator that you like to use in, in kind of the composite of information that you're analyzing? Yes, of course, because uh, see, it is at the center stage of whatever that has been happening since March 2020. You know, we saw a very substantial growth of expansive, you know, uh, quantitative easing which really helped uh, prop up the prices of every risky asset we know today. And uh, when Fed announced that they're gonna tone, tone it down, we, we saw a correction, a very big correction after all. I think with, even if uh, inflation cools down in this report, it is only a validation that Fed's uh, rate hike is working. But we really have to take it as a grain of salt that it, it is actually the indication that it, they will tone down their quantitative uh, tightening as of now because uh, first, they have to wait and watch. That's what they have said in their previous FMB, FMC meetings, that uh, they are very much ready to hike rates mm -hmm. by another 75 basis points in July. Uh, so if inflation even you know comes down, we might see to you know scale them back to 50 BPS, but we will still see a rate hike because that is what uh, the swap market is also predicting already, that we will reach uh, about 3.75% from the current 1.5, 1.75% slab. So we are looking to double that rate uh, by the end of this year. So it does not actually amount that we will recover anytime soon, but 
any sign of uh, slowing in, uh, slowing inflation is a good sign that will uh, churn up in the later dates in the later dates to you know provide us a bottom in in the markets we trade in especially the risky markets definitely and and Danil, i want to pull up this is a good segue for us because yasha you mentioned the the fed interest rate hikes and uh the next fomc meeting later this month is on the 26th and 27th so all eyes are going to be on the fed so as you mentioned, after they raised the interest rates by 75 basis points in June, one of the most significant monthly increases in 28 years, interest rates are expected to increase further following the Federal Open Market Committee meeting later this month. Uh, Sam, what is your take on what may come out of this FOMC meeting? Uh, are we going to expect another 75 basis points? Where do you think we're heading next in regards to this area? Uh, and what's to be expected on the potential impact on the crypto markets? Yeah, so uh, I, I definitely agree uh, with Yashu. I think uh, markets, a lot of hopeful people in the market are underestimating just how much the Fed can hike rates in the cycle. I think there's a lot of people who are hoping that they're going to pivot very soon. I think they're emboldened to continue hiking for the foreseeable future. Um, obviously, the big wild card here is the economy. The Fed is hiking into a declining economy, which even the Keynesian econ economists will say you're not supposed to do. You know, you're not supposed to be hiking rates into a declining economy. But given just how warped you know, our financial system is, that's what the Fed is doing right now because they don't have a choice. Uh, so when it comes to actual recession and, and, and the economy, it usually takes a while for us to really confirm that we're in a full-blown recession. Even if you go back to the 2008 financial crisis, it took quite a while and economic revisions for us to really know, you know oh, oh shit, we're in a recession. So I think they're going to have a lot of leeway to continue hiking rates. I do see July being another month. Now, one of the variables could be the PMI numbers, the Purchasing Managers Index. If those collapse below 50 and stay below 50, there may be more pressure on the Fed to pivot. Um, but any kind of pivot will probably be just a pivot in language. They might tone down their language sometime in the fall. But um, I expect them fully to continue to raise rates. Another variable is going to be the fall itself, because typically September, October are volatile months for stocks. If we see another massive sell off, that could put more pressure on the Fed to step in. But right now, I see them emboldened. They have to do what they have to do. Uh, their legitimacy is at stake. Uh, whatever legitimacy they have left for, for completely blowing this call. So I expect another sizable rate hike uh, and then a few more coming into uh, end of 2022. Very good. And, and Jordan, I want to kick this to you next. Uh, on July 28th, the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis will release an advanced estimate of the U.S.'s GDP for the second quarter of 2022. Uh, after registering a negative 1.6 GDP decline in Q1 of 2022, Atlanta Federal Reserve's GDP now tracker is expecting a negative 2.1 decline in GDP growth for Q2 2022. So Jordan, this brings me to the question, are we in a recession or is this still kind of impending? Is this going to allude to kind of what Sam was saying is that we don't really know it until we're actually uh, the real part of the recession. What are your thoughts on where we are kind of currently from the macro landscape? Yeah, I'd say we're in a recession now. Stock is a pullback, crypto is a pullback. Nobody's really happy with the way things are. And like if anybody that's been paying attention to the economic situation ever since 2008 knows that this whole system has been broken for a while. And yeah, we might all like, why doesn't somebody step up and just do the, the hard, make the hard decision. But then when they start making the hard decisions, we're like, no, lower the, the lower interest rate. Don't do that. But like, like Sam was saying, like if they want to hold any kind of credibility whatsoever in the future, they're going to have to kind of keep going. And regardless of any kind of bucking that we're all doing, they're going to have to, to try and make a difference to solve the problem because if they can't then why do they exist what is their point if they can't do the hard decisions or make the decision the, the choices that need to be done to actually get our economy back on track and it's just like we've been having it really good here in the u.s especially for quite a while now and to expect that it's going to continue like that forever is, is foolish in my opinion we just got some hard times ahead of us trying like pull it together reevaluate what you're doing and like if you need to find another path in life i don't know like there's a lot going on right now. And this is a time of big change going on. That's all I'm saying. And Yasha, what are you seeing right now currently? Uh, do you agree with, with Jordan's assessment that we're, we're kind of currently in this recession? 
Uh, yes, it has already started happening and we are feeling the pressure. We just need to wait for some more jobs report to verify this because uh, it is actually the jobs, you know, that signify that if, if people are losing their jobs and uh, if there is a panic in the market, that actually signifies that we are heading towards a recession or i.e. maybe in the recession. And if you, you just quoted the Atlanta report and uh, if, you, if you just notice that, you know, because their report really is based on an economic data. So during any given quarter, every time a new data point is released, you know, they update the output of the model until the whole quarter is complete. So at this point, you can compare the final output of the model against the actual real GDP for that quarter. So what really happens is that, I mean, in simple words, they tend to under, under, underestimate the GDP a lot. Uh, that is uh, the one of the issues with this report. So what really, what I'm really trying to say that the numbers you're looking at, the GDP, can be pretty far lower, you know, pretty far. And they already, if, if it's showing negative, it can be actually ultra negative. It can be like so, so deep in because they are not actually tracking everything in that uh, in that quarter. You know, it's just based on economic data. So yes, it is right. We can be in a recession. That is a very huge possibility. And while not believing Atlanta GDP, I, I think we are pretty much deep. If they are saying minus 2.1%, 2 .2%, we are deeper than that. Very interesting. Sam, do you, do you agree here? Are we in recession? What's your take? Yeah, well, a technical recession is defined as back-to-back -back quarters of, of negative growth. So if you get back-to-back -back quarters of negative growth, technically you're in a recession. Obviously, in the stagflationary environment that we're in, it gets a little bit more nuanced than that. But I know you asked earlier, you know, what does this all mean for crypto and the market? So I spent years in the TradFi industry, traditional finance, where I would monitor all the FOMC minutes, all the Fed meetings, all that stuff, because that's what the market's main signal was. I came to Bitcoin and crypto thinking that I don't have to care anymore about the Fed, you know, because Bitcoin you know, produces block after block. It's a parallel financial system. Yet now everyone in Bitcoin and crypto is worried about the Fed. The reason is because they're all looking to daddy to bail them out. You know, they want daddy being the Fed to signal that, you know what, we're not going to hike rates anymore. We're going to ease again, which is going to be good for risk assets and hence Bitcoin and crypto because Crypto and Bitcoin have demonstrated that they're a risk asset, especially since the COVID crash. So, you know, a lot of us Bitcoiners, we were right about inflation, but we weren't so right about the inflation hedge, at least not yet. So that's what it all means for the market. They're looking at the Fed for a signal to ease, which is going to be good for risk assets. And that includes crypto. Very good. Ex excellent insights uh, from our experts here. I want to take a second to pivot to the chat. I see a lot of us kind of talking here. We got some folks agreeing with Jordan. Uh, we got Sheltered Corgi chime in on the point that Sam had said recession equals negative GDP for two quarters. Rich New Design, welcome back. Make sure you ask your questions for our experts here. If you want them answered, chime in on chat. Also, don't forget to drop your Twitter handle in because we're going to be selecting a winner for $50 worth of swag at the Coin Telegraph store here at the end of the show. Uh, now, I want to pivot us into, we kind of talked the macro, the three big factors we're going to be keeping an eye on here in July. I want to pivot us into Bitcoin here. And let's talk some local bottoms. Let's talk about where we are uh, currently. There was a report, the MVRVZ score is a tried and tested bottom indicator, but it is not back at the base yet, one analyst warns. And so I want to kind of take a second here to gather our thoughts. I don't know, is this an indicator that you all like to trade with or use this MVRV score um, in it kind of indicating that this new low of 15.6 for Bitcoin, are you all buying this? Uh, is this something that you all like to use in your analysis? I will start here with Jordan first. I have only used it a few times. I, I pull it more off of looking at Bitcoin instead of Glassnode. But it, yeah, it's just it's more of an indicator to me that shows kind of the history of it. And when the indicator gets really low, it's kind of around the time that a bottom comes, which is currently at around now. It still, it's still going to go a little lower compared to previous backs. But it's kind of similar to some of the other indicators that are out there that show around the time that a bear market bottom comes, this indicator also hits a low. I don't know. I'm, I've been started a dollar cost average and other things, not necessarily Bitcoin. I don't know, because what I've I've just noticed my portfolio has actually kind of stayed pretty level of the last few like month actually. Maybe because like the altcoin markets are so illiquid that no and the, the coins have dumped so much that everybody's like, ah, I'm just gonna hold it till the next one now. 
And like, so the everybody's kind of focused on Bitcoin and Ethereum markets. So they're kind of taking the biggest dumps while it's crypto. A lot of the altcoins are staying pretty late, steady just because nobody wants to do anything with them. So I'm kind of looking at those to coins maybe more to, to start dollar cost averaging into. But yeah, I don't I don't really try to pick a Bitcoin bottom. I just kind of get into the general vicinity of a bear market bottom and start doing my thing just like I did back in 2019. You heard it first there. Uh, Sam, how are you approaching this this kind of current Bitcoin dilemma? Uh, are you trying to time a bottom or are you trying to just dollar cost average in and accumulate as much as you can during this phase? Well, in terms of Bitcoin bottom, obviously, you know, you know, the cliche, you can't pick a bottom, blah, 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 all that stuff. We all know that. Um, I, I, I do expect us to head lower at some point just because we've had such a long consolidation now below 20,000. Any kind of rally has has been has been sold and we haven't really had an impressive rally yet. So I do expect a leg lower, um, probably into the mid teens. Um, so for me, it doesn't really, it's not really going to make much of a difference in the long term whether I scoop up now or scoop up at 16,000. Um, in terms of my Bitcoin strategy, it's to accumulate over time and to accumulate as much Bitcoin as I can. So I'm not changing my strategy at all when it comes to that. Very good. And uh, Yashu, how are you approaching things right now? Uh, especially when we're kind of looking at Bitcoin, I know we're going to be diving into a little bit later in your segment, but just kind of your overall high level view uh, of where this bottom potentially could be and how you're approaching and assessing the situation. Uh, see, I'm always backing against the macro fundamentals. And uh, as far as, you know, people do not have money to buy these tokens. And if we are really heading towards a game where people are losing jobs and inflation is super high, even when it cools down, it's really way, way higher than what Fed really anticipated to be, near 2%. So uh, in the cycle, any kind of MVRV Z score, you know, it kind of like, it can predict that, yeah, we, we are completely over uh, sold at this point. And even RSI, a very classic indicator, indicates the same, that we, we are oversold in a Bitcoin market on weekly timeframes. But it does not mean that we bottom out, because there has been many instances in the history of traditional finance in which uh, any market who slips into an oversold territory, it stays there for weeks or months. So yes, it simply reflects that, yeah, Bitcoin has the tendency to bounce, but it does not really mean that it will bottom out. So we really have to watch uh, what really Fed is going to do. As one of, one of the uh, viewers actually commented that, listen to the Fed, follow the Fed. It's actually a smart statement. <laughs> <laughs> whoever you are you are yeah that's what i'm actually trying to say you really have to look into the macro fundamentals and any kind of indicator standalone cannot work in your favor very good uh now i see Catherine rhodes asking what coins are jordan dca into now uh jordan if you feel comfortable sharing if you I like to provide some insights how are you you're the altcoin guy how are you approaching the, the altcoins right now well, this is an investment advice. First off, this is just my opinion, but I'm liking Chainlink. It's got it's a good long-term fundamental project. Polkadot too, I think is going to be uh, nice and big in the next big rally. A newer coin that's actually, I think it's on Kusama. It's called RMRK, just in the NFT field. So those are a few of the ones that I'm really looking at right now. And IMX too. Yeah, the, uh, the gaming and NFT sector is probably going to be a, a big pool in the next, as far as, especially when uh, more, non-crypto people start coming into crypto those are going to be the sectors that they're kind of more likely to come into so i'm kind of looking in that field but yeah polka dot chain link rmrk and imx are, are some of the ones i'm kind of looking at right now very good uh danila i do want to do a quick screen share about bitcoin and then we're going to pivot over to ethereum next uh so danilo if you wouldn't mind bringing up this tweet from crypto bullet uh, these are some of the important levels that they notated was 16K was the average deviation from the moving average 50 day is down negative 25%. 14K 2019 echo bubble top 12.2K is the Celsius liquidation level, which I now think is a little bit lower and 10.7K is the key horizontal level. So these are kind of levels, I guess, that crypto bullet is monitoring and we'll pull up this chart here. Uh, this appears to be the Bitcoin trading view chart here of him kind of mentioning how it's crossed that moving average there. Um, so let's pivot into Ethereum next. We've talked about Bitcoin, but Ethereum's average gas fees have fallen down to 1.5 
dollars. This is huge for those who have been operating on the Ethereum network for the past year or two. You've seen the gas fees, how ridiculous this has been. Um, is, is Ethereum heading down the right path here with lowering these gas fees and making sure that it's, it's a little bit more scalable? Uh, Jordan, I'll kind of kick this over to you first since you are the DeFi expert here in-house. I don't ever judge what Ethereum is doing during a bear market because nobody's using anything. I want to see what it's like when it's actually being, when everybody's over there going crazy over this NFT project or that, I guarantee you the gas price is not going to be $1.57. So I don't know, like, I haven't seen big announcements like we upgraded the, the Ethereum blockchain. And it's more scalable now. So that that factor is just a, it's just a sign of like not people not using the network right now. So I need to see what it's like when it's a, during a time of high use, what the gas prices are like to be like, yeah, Ethereum is starting to figure it out. Because, again, not even the merge is going to solve the, the gas problem. So we'll see what we'll see how that goes. So wait, what I'm hearing is that you're saying that this is just lack of use right now. Was it was NFTs like driving a huge component to those like high gas fees earlier in the year? Yeah, NFTs, land sales, all these types of things were just like crypto kitties back in 2017. Anybody trying to use Ethereum, even back in the early 2021 when DeFi was really popular, it was expensive. So anything that causes a lot of people to start using Ethereum makes the Ethereum fees go up. So right now, the fact that they're low just tells me that nobody's using the network. Very good. Yashu, is Ethereum ever going to uh, completely roll out all of their updates or are we going to spend the next decade uh, hoping and wishing? Oh my God. You've asked me a very difficult question. Whatever the <laughs> answer, I'll be chased by trolls. I mean, come on, ask me a simple one. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, uh, I think I agree with Jordan there. Fees is uh, just a reflection of if people are using the network or not. If there's a demand in the network, uh, so there's so many people want to use it and there's so little space for them. So, of course, the fees increases because then the miners is the king. And right now, it, I don't think anybody is in a condition of using the network. Uh, people bought into NFTs in DeFi, and we are looking at this implosion across the sector with so many companies going down due to liquidation issues. So DeFi is in trouble, in a way. NFTs, their sales have been plummeted as well. And most of the NFT we know were actually launched upon Ethereum blockchain. So it just narrows down to the same place that nobody is using it. Um, and it, as you asked something about the future, so at the risk of uh, really attracting something, um, even if they switch to POS, we still have to see they do it right. I, we have already been looking in so many other you know, uh, projects like Solana, and we are, we are looking at so many other projects. Like, but the good thing is that Ethereum already has uh, this, uh, you know, already like so many takers who want to stay with the network. So once they launch the you know, POS, I cannot actually speculate on how well it will perform, given uh, that they, they will, the Ethereum will be competing with the emerging chains at the same time, such as Cardano, which is with you know very great update recently with Wassel Hartfolk. And then we have Avalanche, we have Solana. So I, had, I also have said that in, in the earlier analysis that it's a very co-joint space. And uh, if Ethereum remains slower for people, they will just move out of it. So you really no comments on uh, how they will do until I see what they do. Very and Sam, I'm curious to hear your take though. It, it when we go into this next bull run, is DeFi going to be just ex, as explosive as the previous? Where do you think kind of DeFi is in its current state, and uh, how resilient will it be in the next run? Well, I guess DeFi has served its purpose. You know, if you get blown up in DeFi, don't expect anyone to come bail you out, right? <laughs> Those are for the big banks. The big banks get bailed out. And DeFi, if you get wrecked, you, you're left holding the bag. I think there's something there with DeFi. I think that uh, you're going to start to see more adoption in the next cycle. It might be a more crowded environment. I think you're definitely going to see more GameFi coming on board. You're probably going to see a lot more of the social tokens, decentralized social media. It might be a more crowded field. But uh, I think that DeFi is here to stay. There's a lot of kinks in the system right now that need to be ironed out. Um, and I think that's it's going to move in that direction for the next cycle. Um, so that's that's what I'm expecting anyway. Very good. And the last topic that I want to dive into today is stable coins. So we went from macro to Bitcoin to Ethereum. Now we're going to touch on these stable coins. One of the big headlines from this week was Circles USDC on track to topple Tether USDT as the top stable coin here in 2022. We have seen Tether and 
just about every single market. We've seen how it goes hand in hand with things, but why is this potential for USDC to topple that tether position such a big deal? Um, I wanna start this out with Sam and see what your thoughts are about this whole USDC potentially overtaking USDT here in 2022. Well, we've seen Circle do a lot of good work in terms of uh, working with regulators, and we've seen adoption uh, grow substantially. Um, I think now USDC is the second largest stable coin by market cap, but it's growing rapidly. So it might not be long before USDC is number one. You also saw it back uh, a new euro backed stable coin. So it seems to have carried a lot of favor with um, you know more institutional investors or people who are really concerned on, on, for the, with, the, with the regulatory side. Um, USDC and Circle have done a good job there. I just think it's growing. I think there's adoption there. I think that the yields that are promised aren't you know overly uh, hyped up. You know, so I think. In terms of market perception, I think USDC is is viewed uh, as as a safer bet. Then again, Tether has been the recipient of a lot of FUD. If you recall, Tether you know came into existence as a way to really help crypto traders access liquidity, because it was very difficult to get a banking on ramp into crypto back in the day. So, a company came in and started offering a stablecoin, and it solved a lot of the problems. I'm not saying Tether is perfect, but I think it's been. Um, you know, the, 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 I'm receiving end of, of a lot of FUD, perhaps unnecessarily. So I think USDC is, is, is gaining traction and that could continue. I think stable coins will play a pretty substantial role in crypto adoption moving forward and perhaps a better alternative to what I like to call slave coin, which is the CBDC. Wow, wow, wow. So is, are, are CBDCs going to compete head to head with USDT or, or USDC in the future? Maybe not. I mean, I know, like, for example, CBDCs have no threat on Bitcoin, for example, and they don't necessarily have to threaten the stable coins. But I think just the way the CBDC projects are rolling out, it seems like central banks are really pushing this as, as an extension of their of their power. So I don't want to live in a world where CBDCs run dominant. I do not want to live in that world uh, because basically all of us will have an account at the Fed. And which means that they can cut off our access to money anytime we do something they don't like. So that's that's the real threat, I think, with CBDC. There's, there's a lot of issues there. But I think with stable coins, what you see is that a lot of people in, in developing countries are using them to, to bypass inflation and restrictions and things like that. So I think stable coins do have a, a, a viable market, and, and we've seen that. I think, Yashu, I think why do you... Yeah. I think that they I'm will sure. like be a little like I think like most normal people are not going to just jump into stable coins. They haven't gotten into crypto so far. They're not going to just jump into something that the government's not not pushing them towards. The government is going to push them towards CBDCs. I mean, like the only difference right now is that it's not set up established system. But a CBDC is going to basically be like the US dollar or the current fiat system. It's just definitely a little bit more controllable by them. So I think that the majority of people are unfortunately probably going to start off with CBDCs. Maybe that'll help bridge them into cryptos. That's what we all hope as crypto people. But the mo most people just kind of go along with the legacy system. So I don't see that changing anytime soon. And as far as uh, USDC and USDT, I think USDT has kind of been the black, like the black sheep of the family. Or it had a lot of controversy over the years from way back in 2017, where like virtue for different financial, different financial companies or which bank holds the, the, the reserves for this coin. So I think the USDC might be trying to pivot a pivot towards more legitimacy. It's an established company that's always worked within the framework of the US regulations. So I think even that's maybe just kind of help bring more legitimacy to the crypto ecosystem by saying having USDC be the top stable coin versus USDT. In, in Yashu, is there anything from like a mechanical technical perspective that would really differentiate USDC versus a USDT? Or is this just come down to like personal preference and the, the amount of security that one may feel like they get behind each stable coin? Well, the core tenet of both the project is the same to provide people an alternative to US dollar that can be, you know, that can execute their trades faster. So that is the function and they are actually quite performing it well. The real problem is that we have already seen the collapse of some of the most so-called trustworthy firms in the sector. So all of these doubts that has been thrown at 
dated right now. It's yeah, it, it has started to hurt them. So which has which has resulted in such a massive decline in their reserves in the past two months ever since uh, Terra collapsed. So there is a lot of distrust, and I think uh, Tether, yes, they, any kind of deep egg that has happened in the history, they have been able to come back out of it. They have been able to stabilize their coin. So in in theory, they have not really told people that we cannot actually redeem your coins. There is no report like that, as far as I'm, I know. I've never seen anybody complaining that they actually neglected uh, refunding your money. So I think they are doing what they can. And uh, recently, I also read that uh, the CTO announced that they will go through a Big 12, you know, auditing round by a Big 12 firm. And so everything will be far more clear after that. But it's just a promise for now. So, so and when I, when I talk about USDC, I think they were built upon uh, the flaws of USDT, the so-called flaws of USDT. They tried to take care of all the issues that were prevalent in that company, all the doubts they tried to focus on by you know getting regulated by FinCEN and 12 other regulators in US by uh, releasing their audit reports so they have been pretty much you know trying to make sure that they are they are clear of all the troubles which is why we are looking at this uh, you know so called flipping event approaching recently that does not actually kill tether though uh, tether still has you know has not like you know given any reason to be not trusted by because they are redeeming their coins that's it that's all I know because that is why we are looking at this uh, one dollar peg, even with these reserves going down. Fascinating, and you know how I know we're in a bear market is when we are arguing about USDC and USDT. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Uh, well, you guys heard it here from the experts in their thoughts about some of the biggest news in the space right now and what to be on the lookout for here in the weeks ahead couple big meetings, couple big reports coming out. So we're going to see what shakes out. I think things are going to be gloomy here for the next uh, foreseeable future. So we'll see what happens. But go ahead and drop your Twitter handle in the chat. We're going to be giving away $50 to the Cointelegraph swag shop at the end of the show. Um, what we have next for you is a, crypt, a quick crypto tips. And we're going to tell you how about how to think long term in these markets. So Danilo, let's go ahead and jump into our crypto tips for this week. All right, many new traders want to make it big fast. Many create unrealistic expectations, hoping to be lucky enough to make millions in just a few months. It is possible not to make money fast from the market, having long-term plan, and that will help you continue to be positive. Long-term trades have proven to be successful investing methodology. Elite tier investors like Warren Buffett prefer this method, but it requires in-depth research and analysis. In addition, long-term investments require a lot of patience as it is a buy and hold process. Many traders find it hard to stay put with their long-term plans as they intend to close trade once the investment moves about 50% upward or downward, making many miss out on big market opportunities. In 2021, Bitcoin had daily volatility of about 5% and increased from $13,373 all the way up to $61,000 between October 20th and October 2021. That was about a 460% increase within a year for a long-term trader, but heaps cash out at first sight of decent profit, missing out on later gains. Remember, we're not advising on when you should take profits or how to manage your funds. You are best positioned to make the decisions on your crypto investments, and this does not constitute investment advice, financial advice, trading advice, or any sort of advice. Make sure you set your targets and are comfortable with this. There will always be the fear of missing out. You could have had bigger gains. You could have had less losses. Set your profit targets for what you feel to be comfortable and be in this for the long run. Those are our crypto tips for this week. Thank you, Danilo. All right. Now I want to take a second to check the chat. We got people chattering in there. Uh, looks like we have Enigma VSN. Did you guys take profit off Bitcoin at the top? Let's answer this quick community question. Uh, I'll kick this to Jordan first. Did you take profits at the top of Bitcoin? I took some profit, not on Bitcoin, but some other cryptos. But I wish I would have taken more. Sam, did you take the profits at the top? Uh, I've sold no Bitcoin and it's going to take a lot for me to sell my Bitcoin. I took profits from altcoins into Bitcoin. Yes, I did. 
I'm not saying it was at the top, but it was on the way up and then later on the way down, you know, when the writing was apparently on the wall. If you ask you, profits at the top? Well, accidentally I did. Because I was just <laughs> taking a trip, you know, I, I just wanted to go to Egypt, enjoy some things, and I needed some cash. So accidentally I sold uh, some Bitcoins in December and it turned out to be, I was not calling for it, by the way. I was still going to hold. I'm just long-term five-year holding kind of a guy, but yeah, that was for the trip. I'm lucky I took that trip. Very good. Yeah, I'm grateful that I decided to buy a house this year because it was like right at the right time in that first peak, early in like April. Like, yeah, I caught that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's what matters actually. You should only sell when you need the money. <laughs> I mean, or just keep, you know, some, some like in, for the rain check, you should have some stable coins, of course, for that. but. Yeah, I was too bullish by November, you know, even I, then I was thinking that it won't go down. So, yeah, it was very accidental for me. And having that long term view, I think, always helps, uh, especially during moments like this, when you can kind of zoom out and see, OK, maybe I'm positioning myself for the next run. But for those long term holders like Sam, sounds like it doesn't matter what day it is. He wants his Bitcoin and he wants to hold on to it. Uh, so I know we have some exciting stuff that we're going to be diving into with Yashu next. He's going to give us his in-depth analysis about Bitcoin's inverse correlation with the U.S. dollar hitting a 17-month high. So let's go ahead and get into Yashu's expert segment for today. So now I have the floor. So before actually beginning i just want to say that bitcoin and the us dollar should not actually have a direct correlation with each other it is simply because the dollar derives its strength or weakness from the performance of its top rival assets such as the euro pound swiss franc so there is actually nothing that you know connects these two markets so what we are seeing in the name of their inverse correlation as i written in my article is actually it's very purely psychological because right now, Bitcoin is trading like a riskier asset, while the dollar is offering what it offers the best during an economic crisis, which is called safety. So let me take a few steps back just to explain why, because traditional investors, you know, what we have looking in, in the past few centuries in the stock market, that what they actually do is they distribute their portfolio in two parts. It's called a 60-40 portfolio strategy. So they, so they keep 60% of their, uh, I mean, normally, they keep 60% of their portfolio in stocks, which is a riskier asset, and 40% in bonds, which is actually a safe haven. So, but if we look at the first half of 2022, the 60-40 strategy is bleeding millions of dollars out already. And the reason why, because if you look at S&P 500 stock index, which is the benchmark stock index, it's down over 40% year to date. And on the other hand, the yield on 10 year, which is also a benchmark yield, the 10 year US Treasury note is also like up 65% in this year. And there is actually a thing that when the yield rally, the bond rates fall. So we are looking at this big portfolio, 60 40 portfolio, where stock is also falling and the bonds are also falling. So that is why they are bleeding millions of dollars. And if any, by any luck, if they are holding Bitcoin in the same portfolio, the same Bitcoin, which is down more than 60% in this year. So I can't even imagine the losses they are making. So imagine like that investor, what, what way would you go in this market when your entire portfolio is red? Where do you find, you know, the next thing where you can actually put your money? So yes, you can, you have the option to long energy stocks because, uh, you know, energy prices are higher, so they can go there. They can long agriculture commodities for the purpose of hedging, or simply they can just move back to the dollar because that is what a traditional safe haven looks like. It's a global reserve asset. So, like I said, there is no direct correlation. It is just uh, this riskier asset. It's when bond is bond is also acting like a riskier asset. So you have no way to go but to the dollar. So, which is why we are looking at this inverse correlation and very accidental inverse correlation between Bitcoin and the U.S. dollar index. So, moving forward, what I what I want to say that is because we have FOMC officials. You know, they are giving thumbs up to another zero point seven five percent rate hike. And I, as I told earlier in the show, it's right now 1.5% to 1.75%. So what we are looking at is uh, traders are now betting that by the end of this year, the rate will be 3.3%. So that's after a drop in inflation adjusted spending for May and a slide in U.S. manufacturing activity in June. It means that the U.S. growth is actually slowing down 
which could have the Fed either pause or scale back its QT attitude, which is quantitative tightening attitude. So yeah, we have some months of pain ahead of us. Uh, and in that, in that moment, we can see that uh, the dollar is already creating an uh, overbought position and Bitcoin is in oversold position. So yes, we are looking at this inverse correlation to continue in the future, in which Bitcoin will bottom out and US dollar will top out. And this is how this inverse correlation will last. But yeah, they are still not, uh, you know, directly correlated to each other. That's all I guess. So, yeah. so, uh, Jordan or, or Sam, do you have any questions for, for Yashu first? How high do you think the DXY can go? I mean, we just cracked 106 today, which is, you know, I thought that, that we may have peaked a little while ago at 105 and then it went back down. Do you have any insight how much longer this can go up? Sam, I think we'll have to go and do some technical analysis if you have if I have a minute. So I'm going to share the screen. Uh, and I'm always, uh, you know, late when I'm sharing the screen because that's who I am. Hang on. <laughs> so, yeah, here we are. You're looking at this dollar currency index. I'm just going to remove this detail. Switch to a more apprehensive format here. Add some RSI just to see the mm -hmm. levels and yeah, just close it down. So you can see already on this weekly chart, we are actually creating a bearish divergence. You have this higher high, a very high mm -hmm. actually on RSI. And there is where there is where you have a top here and then we make a lower RSI and another higher high in the prices. So you can see this divergence between the rising prices and falling RSI. That is actually an indication that uh, the market is reading it wrong. So yes, we might spend some time in the zone, 106, 1012. We can, yes, because uh, the macro fundamentals support it. The Fed is going to increase interest rates by the end of this year. It has to be 3.35% according to the dot plot. So yes, we can spend some time here, which means more uh, you know, bearish divergence here. And once it's done, once we have like completely exhausted our time in the RSI zone here, we will see a drop down where it will drop. I mean, that's the question. So I'm actually just going to zoom out this thing to one month. I mean, DXY was born before I was born. So, you know, I always amazed that it was, there was something before me. <laughs> so mm -hmm. this is what I'm actually anticipating. If it, if it tops down in here, because we have seen, uh, it, this is the previous target here. If I simply switch it here, just a moment. Yeah. So we can simply see that the next range target is right now near is 108. So I'm really anticipating that for this year, we might hang out around this point. There are some psychological supports here, which, you know, so we, we might see a rally to 112 or 110. But this is where I think this DXY market can top out. So I'll just stop sharing. And so, I mean, real quick, Yashu, so like, what is it telling you? Why is that uh, particular chart so important when you're kind of like analyzing, assessing uh, your next move in the markets? Because see, I mean, technical analysis is all about the things traders before me have done. It really shows us, you know, where they were the most active and where they were the least active. So we are just using on the psychological factors of uh, entering a position. But which is, which is why I always try to combine the fundamental into it. The reason I'm saying it's going to go up is because we still have a hawkish Fed around us. And uh, they are looking to interest, uh, raise interest rate as we had discussed earlier. So it could, it could lead to a stronger dollar down the road. As I discussed that, the 60-40 portfolio is already suffering. The, and because of these rate hikes, uh, the interest, I mean, the interest rates on these bond yields, you know, they are also going to go up. So, yes, there is no way to escape this scenario for now until, you know, Fed decides that, yes, you can escape. Yes, I'm going to just tone down on all the free money uh, I had taken. So I'm just going to tone it down. I'm going to give you some back. I'm going to make sure that there's enough liquidity in the market. That is when the dollar actually falls. Hmm. Yeah, it seems to me like insight. everybody's kind of flooding into the dollar because there's nowhere else that's safe. Like no, no asset has been going up, like except for oil went up for a while, but even that's kind of been going down lately. So like everybody's running to the dollar because it's the only choice. 
teams like an that's actually a good like point, you know. That's actually a good point because you know some changes on that on that side. Exactly, Jordan. Because you know, in the index, we have like fifty three percent, you know, euro. That's how it's uh, done. It's like compared with fifty three percent of the euro. The euro right now is going down because of all the trouble, the geopolitical issues taking place in the Eastern uh, Europe, and uh, the inflation, the gas issues. You know, they they are running into a very uh, great inflation mode right now. So the confidence in their economy is pretty low, and that is why euro is underperforming against dollar for a very long time. So, uh, so yes, that's actually a good point. That this is, this can also actually propagate, you know, this U.S. rally further. Excellent insights. Uh, we appreciate you walking us through all of that. You got it, folks. The the macro level, the insights, the detail, the TA. We got it for you. I see Nick Sals looks like he's a, a newcomer here to the market report. Welcome, Nick Sals. Glad to have you here in the comments. Vikram, tell him what's up, man. Uh, all right. Next, we got the Markets Pro segment here. Uh, we're going to give you two of the tokens you should have been watching this week based on some of our indicators on that platform. And don't forget, we're going to be giving away our $50 swag gift certificate at the end of the show. For those that are dropping their Twitter handle in the chat, we will select that at the end of the show. But first, let's go ahead and get you the two tokens you should have been watching this week with our Markets Pro platform. All right, folks, Mina, that was a token you should have been watching this week, trading under the ticker M-I-N-A. And this one was caught by our Newsquake alerts, which these are these automated alerts that instantly notify users of market moving events. What would happen this week? Huobi Global recently announced that it would list Mina information that a Newsquake alert rapidly shared with Markets Pro subscribers. The news dropped when the token was trading at around 63 cents and less than 24 hours after that, the price shot up to 77 cents. That's a 21% increase. And one of the big things that we want to talk about here is this news quick alert. I see on the screen, it looks like we have uh, the other token that we're going to be talking about today, which is CONV. This one hit on the Vortex score and Vortex score is a comparison between current market and social conditions of those in the past. A high Vortex score of 80 or higher is considered confidently bullish. Conversely, Vortex score of 30 or lower is historically bearish. Well, what happened this week, CONV, a multi-chain protocol utility token on the Ethereum and Moonbeam network, saw a massive price pump early in the week. On June 26, a high Vortex score began to light up, rising from 94 to the rare, the unicorn folks, the rare 100 Vortex score. That's the strongest we've ever seen. This string of strong scores alerted Marcus Pro subscribers of a potential trading opportunity based on past conditions. Sure enough, that price was at 0 0.000792 when scores began flashing and it soon skyrocketed its weekly high of about 0 0.002 cents. That's a 173% increase. If you have Markets Pro, folks, you are going to get these alerts. You're going to be able to action these trades as quickly as possible, and it will link you straight to the exchange so you can make that trade happen within an instant. Folks, that's the power of Markets Pro, and that's why we want you to give it a go. Give out Markets Pro, Markets Pro a try. All right. Thank you, Danil. That was going to wrap up our Markets Pro segment today. And we're going to allow folks to stick their Twitter handle in the chat we appreciate everyone tuning in around the globe today, and we're going to select that one winner for that $50 gift card. But I want to hear closing thoughts today. I want to hear not financial advice, but give me life advice maybe. We'll start with Jordan. Yeah, like I always say, go out and enjoy life because crypto is going to suck for a while, man. Like it, we're not like the whole, the whole world economy is kind of going to shit. So to expect crypto to just blow off, it ain't, it's, not, it's not realistic right now. So, you know. Make a game plan, like uh, Benton talked about earlier. Have a long-term plan and set. You know, pick your bottom, pick your price till you're gonna buy it. Pick your price at the top. Set those on an exchange, and then go outside and enjoy the sun because it's gonna be a, a it's gonna be a rough couple months, man. Like, look for a bull market in 2023, maybe 2024, right? Woo! <laughs> I always love Jordan's insights. It's it's just it's very simple yet it's it's uh 
it, you got to take it to heart. You got to get outside. You got to, there's a life outside of crypto. So Jordan, always appreciate you bringing a little light uh, into the situation. Not everything is about crypto. Sam, let's hear your closing thoughts, any insights, any advice you may have for those watching at home today. Well, if you decide to sell your Bitcoin, you have to start asking yourself, then what? So you sell your Bitcoin, your Bitcoin is gone. You Okay, now what? Like, what's, what's the game plan? Is the game plan to continue to accumulate the fiat death spiral? Are you going to take that fiat and convert it into any other asset? If you give up your Bitcoin, now what? So I just want everyone to kind of think about that. Everyone is so eager to maybe sell a pump that might come. And I expect there to be a pump, maybe back to 30000 at some point. But you, un you unload that, then what? The goal should be to accumulate as much as you can. Not financial advice, that's my opinion. But have that perspective. Don't be so eager to part with your Bitcoin just because the bear market is affecting your mood. So keep that in mind. Excellent insights. Always maintain and manage the emotions during these times. Great insights from Sam. Yashu, any closing thoughts or life advice for us today here on the Mark Report? Now, well, if, if I say life advice, dudes, guys, just watch Top Gun. It's one of the best movies I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, that's like, I'm like blabbing about it all week. Yeah, if you haven't seen Top Gun, watch Top Gun. And <laughs> as far as crypto is concerned, uh, yes, make money, uh, learn a skill, make more money. That's where you will, you know, be able to make sure that you have enough money to spend and not sell your Bitcoins. Because yes, you have to survive through this market. If you sell now, it's going to be a loss making trade. But in five years later, you will be looking at back at your portfolio and, you know, just kicking yourself. Why did I not listen to <laughs> maybe Sam's advice that to yeah, hold it, hold it for a while. And uh, so this is very important that your liquidity needs should come handy. So yes, always be dependent on a skill to make money, not trades. Investment is a good advice, but do not just uh, waste all your time 24 seven you know, trading. It's not good. Very good, folks. We appreciate. Uh, yes, Jordan, you got something to add? In bear markets, the best way to make money in crypto is to work in crypto. So that, that just work in crypto, all right? <laughs> That's the only way you're going to make money in the bear market. <laughs> and we're hiring here, folks. We're hiring at Coin Telegraph. So uh, yeah, make sure you check out our jobs board. Good advice from all of our panelists today. Uh, my advice for you is have that long-term vision. We are going to be in this for a while. So zoom out, enjoy your life. Crypto is not 100% everything. It could be a large part of it, but understand there's a life outside of crypto. Folks, I'm going to give you the winner for today. Uh, the crypto Twitter handle that I'm going to select to today is going to be, uh, looks like Ahmed Bawazir uh, at B-A-W-A -A underscore 77. You are our winner today. You get $50 to the Cointelegraph swag shop. Folks, this has been real. We appreciate everyone for tuning in from around the globe. Always special moments here on the Market Report. And until next week, we hope you're tuning in. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Coin Telegraph on YouTube. We're here every Tuesday, 12 p.m. Eastern. Until next time, folks, over and out.